having a voiceless people, I'm, I'm, we're voiceless, right? And I'm voiceless. I have no voice. I have no say. My story is inappropriate. Too much info. But I can sing and have a little few words before each song. So that's my voice now. And as an older pe person, I want to talk about all my friends that didn't make it. That's where the real grief comes in. Because they were supposed to be here too. Enjoying all these years. These years that we earned. And the mortality rate is so high for us, you know? Unnecessarily so. Misfortune. Circumstance. You know? And, um, fires, accidents, and diseases. You know, took about, you know, one third of my class from kindergarten. So that's pretty, pretty significant percentage increase in or, or not overall Canadian average, I'm assuming. You know? So that's where my songs come in. That's where my, my songs are a description of that kind of uh, experience of being Indigenous. And now I had to shift. I had to shift and bend and do whatever it is I had to say in order to be safe. And I'm still shifting and still bending, you know. And everybody today is shifting and bending too. They're identity shifting. And they're gatekeeping and cultural gatekeepers. And protocol priorities. And everybody's obsessed with identity. And even me, myself, I was... a always obsessed for what kind of identity I'd have and being a cowboy from Tennessee and being this and that. And so being older now, I can, I can be comfortable who I am. There's nothing more pathetic than a bitter punk rocker. I'll never forget when um, I was being told I was going to go into brain surgery and I was despondent. I was crying and crying. I wanted to write a letter to my mom and the nurse went and got a paper for me and a pen and I actually wrote uh, I'm sorry for my recklessness I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm making you cry making you worry and I'm not afraid the Lord is with me and that's your last thoughts before you die man if you only have two minutes that's what you're going to say tell my mom I'm not afraid that's the last thing you think man because the nurse was prepping me for brain surgery and I'm crying eh? and, and she's saying don't worry we're going to save you I told her, you're going to be the last person I see. Nobody loves me here. It's so clinical, you know. I didn't want to die there. And she says, no, I love you. I love you. Just in case I did die, right? She wanted to end my time on, on, on earth with somebody telling me she loved me. So that nurse uh, said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then I went into the brain surgery. So that was the last thing I heard was, was I love you. <laughs> so Arias for Grace is my life's work composed into... 20 songs, and it takes about an hour to go through. And um, it, it, it shows Cree musicality and dynamics and harmony and melody. So of course, it begins with a lullaby. This is the first song I learned as a baby, as I heard as a baby. And the original version goes like this. Man, man. So, so I'd blend it like this, right?
when the stars come out tonight I'll be there to hold you Never, never leave you When the stars come out tonight When the stars come out tonight I'll be there to hold you Never, never leave you alone When the stars come out tonight, I'll be there to hold you, never, never leave you alone. Hey, hi, 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 Along those lines, everything will be kind of connected. And I'd play like a series of 10 minute long songs, three or four 10 minute long songs, is how it would be delivered. Because I can't sing a 40 minute song. Maybe if I work hard enough. <laughs> I, th I think afterwards, the effects of having a near death experience is what was most remarkable because no doctor could relate no shaman could relate no priest could relate no counselor could relate no therapist could relate nobody could relate because it's such a personal deeply personal thing i'm just standing naked in front of god and nobody there to hold my hand so you imagine what what that how jarring of an experience that is to stand naked in front of like you're on the last step of the universe on your tippy toes and if you lean forward god's gonna catch you and that's where I was. I was ready to go. I seen that I had grace and that everything is about for others. You have to give and share. And I seen the secrets of cooperation and, and um, benevolence. So to see that so vividly without language and then pull back and wake up in my body and the paramedics were waking me up. That was the most difficult thing to come to terms with because I seen instantly how... Um, meaningless our, this world is and our pursuits and our obsessions and to, de des to describe it was um, impossible there was no way I could de describe it like I believe near death survivors are the original prophets from thousands of years ago because what I seen was a template for cooperation how to uh, help your your fellow man, especially if they're different from you, especially if they don't speak the same language as you. So I could see how somebody could survive a stroke or a heart attack uh, thousands of years ago, and he'd come back and have these um, insights. So I believe near-death experiences are, are, they predate language, and they predate culture, and they predate, predate um, um, religion. Tens of thousands of years ago, human beings were having near death experiences, and that's probably a way that um, the Creator um, impacted us with holy wisdom of benevolence.